that's sort of my mission as a as a lawyer and podcaster myself. I want to see this industry, if you will, flourish and people be able to do their thing, get their message out without too much trouble. Welcome to Podcasting Smarter, the podcast for and by podcasters. We interview podcasters for the real scoop on podcasting. Whether you're thinking about starting a podcast or have been podcasting for years, you'll find lots of inspiration, valuable lessons, and tips in our interviews. This podcast is brought to you by Podbean. Please visit podbean.com, the home for podcasters. Well, Gordon, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. How's it going over there in California? It's great to be here, John. Uh, you know, California, we're, we're locked down in our houses. Uh, don't go out unless it's an emergency or, or, you know, an essential thing. And the kids are in the other room doing their schoolwork. And it's a new, no- I think it's a new normal. Uh, we're just getting word that it, our kids probably aren't going to go back to school this academic year. So that's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been very similar over here in New Jersey. You know, there's varying degrees of uh, quarantining depending where you are, but we're starting to see that I'm at least I'm happy about it. We talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but yeah. you know, we are a technological culture now in 2020. And I think that there is more of an embrace for this kind of learning as opposed Absolutely. to let's say 20, 30 years ago. I think this is great. I mean, yeah, obviously I, we want the, we want everything to get better, but you know, we have the technology to make it until then. I think this will cause be the impetus that moves things into the online space in a bigger way. Also, we're already on the way there, but uh, you know, businesses running online and doing their thing, it's going to be a new normal, as I said. And um, uh, the good news is, you know, for people who've already been creating media, none of this is really that new. Um, the difference may be you don't have someone come to your studio to do an interview, but you're doing like we are today. And so podcasters, I think we're ahead of the game. I would say so. Yeah. You've seen a lot of uptick in live streams. And even recently when it comes to uh, just starting podcasts in this way, in the way of communicating digitally, even over the last couple of weeks, I think we've seen a big uptick in that. So it's pretty exciting. And actually the questions that we want to talk about today stem from a, a post that you made a couple of weeks ago over on Facebook here. And it was titled, here's some free legal advice for podcasters. But I feel like the topics that you covered there, even though they're just one or two sentences long, touch on a lot of really important legal points and just a lot of really important points in general that podcasters should be thinking about whether they're new to the game or whether they've got a couple of years under their belts. Because I think between you and I, we've seen podcasters who are well experienced and may still have uh, opportunities to fix some of this stuff up. Or if you're just getting into the game, you know, really cover yourself starting at the beginning. Well, actually, thanks for calling it for not calling it a rant, although I think that's kind of what it was that day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, these are the, the, the things that I see happening often enough that I felt it was worth writing out, you know, some some notes and, you know, hey, don't do these things, do do these things and and uh, protect yourself. That's that's sort of my mission as a as a lawyer and and podcaster myself. I want to see this uh, this industry, if you will, flourish and uh People be able to do their thing, get their message out without too much trouble. So glad to be able to help people. Absolutely. So we'll just start right at the top here. The first thing is in your post, you said just use a release with your guests. It's not that hard or expensive and it could save you someday. Um, I'd like to ask you, why is it important to have a release form for your interviews? You know, I think a lot of podcasters, they only see the content side of the podcast and of the interviews. But I think sometimes we tend to often overlook those God forbid scenarios, you know, you turn around and an interviewer says, Hey, or someone who you interviewed may come back and say, I don't want that up anymore. Uh, Tell us why it's important to have a release for your interviews. Well, first off, you need to have, you know, a formal permission from the person to record their voice in, in most States, not all States, but we have, you know, the person has a right to say yes or no to being recorded. And beyond that, even if you're in one of those states where you only need one side of a conversation's permission to record, to use it in a way that, that you know, makes it public is a different game. And uh, you, need, you need a person's permission to make their performance, if you will, uh, public. So step one is the permission. Step two is ownership of the content. You know, if you don't have the, the right language, you know, there, there can be questions raised about whether you actually own the whole thing or does the other party own a portion or are you co-owners of the recording or those kinds of things. And then you get into questions about money. You know, if, if you do monetize your show or if you use that material later on as a part of a information product or, you know, behind a, a paywall or something like that, does that person have a right to get paid from the stuff that you did together? Um, 
And then finally, there's, yeah, there's that issue of somebody coming along and saying, you know, I changed my mind. I don't want that podcast, uh, that recording to be public anymore. Take it down. Uh, I, as my point of view is sometimes it's okay to take it down. Sometimes it isn't, but that should be the podcaster's decision. After all, the podcaster has made the investment of time and energy and resources to make the thing happen and publicize it and, and, you know, publish the show. And so it, it should be on squarely on the podcaster's uh, side of the equation to decide whether or not to take it down. After all, some of us are doing, you know, what I would characterize as true journalism. And when you are doing a, a series of stories on a topic or you just feel like you're getting a particular uh, coverage of a particular topic for someone to come along and say, hey, that episode has to go. Now that leaves a gap in your RSS feed that raises eyebrows and questions for some people, but it also takes out valuable, good information off the market. And uh, again, I think that that should be our decision to make and not the guest who has second thoughts. Now that, that said, I'll just say, if you have a guest who has second thoughts and it's going to cost them their job or, <laughs> or they're going to get in some kind of trouble, then, you know, you may, you do the right thing. You make a decision to pull it down anyway, but again, it should be on, you know, up to you and not, not them. Of course. And now would you say also that let's say uh, some podcasters before they go into the interview may on record and on the recording have a, uh, let's say just like a written out thing and an agreement that's yeah. recorded. Does that count also, or would you say it's two separate things altogether? Well, it, it can count, but I want to, you know, the, the caveat is you got to say the right words the right way every single time. And right. I think a lot of folks don't do it. You know, if you're reading from a script, then I suppose, yeah, you're going to get it right every time if you remember to read from the script <laughs> verbatim. Uh, and so I actually do uh, offer a free release form that people can get uh, downloaded. Just visit podcastrelease.com and give me your email address and I'll send you this form. And in, in the packet that you get, the, the PDF that you'll get, there is a, a, a sort of a script for it as well. So uh, you can do that oral. I, I like to see a, you know, a, a piece of paper or a, a web form that you fill out and you know, check the box and that kind of thing, just to really affirmatively manifest the intention to, to give the release and be bound by the contract. Yeah, it's really important because a lot of, again, when you interview somebody, I guess a lot of people consider that the act alone of doing the recording is enough of a, uh, enough of a release. But like you said, unless you have it on record, what the terms and conditions actually yeah. are, it could add a little, uh, could add a lot of legal pitfall later on. Yeah, it's true. Contracts can be implied from the way you behave and your conduct, but the challenge becomes proving, well, what does the contract really provide for. And, uh, you know, if it doesn't say irrevocable, if it doesn't say in perpetuity, if it doesn't say any and all media now known or hereafter devised, then maybe you're only allowed to use it on your podcast episode for the week that it comes out and then it's supposed to be gone, you know, something crazy like that. So uh, you don't want to have to get into a situation where you're paying lawyers to go to court to fight over these kinds of things. So having it on paper makes the difference. Sure. And now actually keeping around the legalities of a lot of what podcasters may, let's say, overlook or, you know, release things like that. Another point that you brought up was fair use is a thing, but it's very expensive to prove you're right. And it only works in the U.S. So just don't rely on it. Um, Copyright.gov defines it as legal doctrine, that, legal doctrine that promotes freedom or expression by permitting the unlicensed use of copyright protected works in certain circumstances, providing the statutory framework for determining whether something is fair use and identifies certain types of uses, such as criticism, uh, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research, and as examples of activities that may qualify for fair use. Uh, there's a section 107 that dives into the specificities of that, mm -hmm. but how can podcasters ensure that they fall within the rights of fair use? Because again, sometimes it seems like there may be a uh, misunderstanding of what fair use covers, especially when you're talking about it in the audio world and even more specifically in the podcasting medium. Yeah. Well, the short answer to the question about how, how podcasters can ensure that they fall within the rights of fair use is that they can't. <laughs> that's um, fair. Go to court and fight the lawsuit and that's how you prove it and you ensure it. And that's the real problem. So, you know, fair use is this very complicated legal doctrine. I, I, I would characterize it, although it, the it's a question of whether it really is legally considered a defense to copyright infringement. The way it operates is somebody sues you and you go to court 
and you say, but your honor, it's fair use, let us out of this lawsuit. So you're defending, right? And because it's a complicated standard, a complicated four-factor analysis that you have to go through on each individual allegation of copying, it's very time-consuming and costly to do that lawsuit, to fight that lawsuit. And when you win, you don't get your attorney's fees covered. You don't, you know, you're still paying your lawyer to, to get you out of this, you know, <laughs> quagmire, I guess. So that's why I say just don't rely on it. Now, the fact of it is the four factors, it, there are some situations where it really does work. And there is some law that says uh, that a plaintiff is supposed to consider fair use before they bring their lawsuit, before they bring the DMCA takedown notice, because they, they're, if, they're, if they're exercising their copyright rights in bad faith, then they could be punished with fines and, and penalties too. So, you know, you got to figure out these, these four factors. And you notice that it's uh, in what you read that criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research are examples of activities that may qualify as fair use. It's not a given that if you're doing teaching or, or research or news reporting, that it's automatically going to be fair use. It's going it, to, there are three other factors to be considered. So uh, I can go over the factors if you, if that's useful, but it, it, my point is that it's really a very complex analysis. You have to think about what the original uh, took from the, I'm sorry, what the, what the copy seems to take from the original and what the purpose and character of that is, how much was taken, the amount and substantiality. You have to consider the nature of the original and, and whether this new use is sort of transformative. Does it change the, the fundamental character of the work? And the fourth factor is the, the potential impact on the market for the original. So when you use a little piece of music in your, in your show open, <clears throat> there's a market for licensing music. So it's not like you can't get it otherwise. And yeah, you're using, probably using the hook of the music, which is the amount and substantiality portion. And, you know, using it as a show opener or something like that is uh, sort of a quasi-commercial use. It, you know, even though your podcast may be educational or scholarly or, or reporting, the intro is a promotional thing that you're doing, you know, so I don't think that weighs necessarily one way or the other. So you got all these factors to consider and um, ask a judge or a jury and, you know, it's hit or miss. Every case is its own case and you got to prove it. That's the hard part. And I think that's an important point that you brought up too, because if you're medium, like let's say you run a podcast that's solely around education and you have a tag from one of your favorite artists that you know, intros you for the first, let's say three to four seconds of your podcast, yep. because your podcast is educational, it may not mean that the use of that music is specifically fair use. So it's a matter of the intent of use is what it sounds like you're saying too. Yeah. Let, let's actually talk about that a little more because, sure. you know, if, if it's an educational podcast, but you're using a piece of, I don't know, Rolling Stones music just as a, as a bumper between two segments of your show. Well, that's not educational. That's just production stuff, right? Right. Now, if you were talking about the musical structure of the song and and the melodic line and how Jagger's voice combines with Richards's guitar, you know, that kind of stuff, that might be an educational analysis of the song that would be or is more likely to be found to be fair use. But that bumper or the open and close music or, or even if it's just a music bed under you talking, that's not really educational use, even though the show itself might be educational in nature. Right. And you see, I think YouTube now really taking a lot of stances with this. You know, there's so many YouTube videos out there that you're talking about a five to 10 minutes, sometimes an hour. And it just says, I don't own it, but this is under fair use. It's like, well, <laughs> not that that doesn't count. That doesn't do anything. But right. like you said here, it's really a matter of the, you know, the length and really the, the medium that you're using it for, or the, the reason I should say, not the medium. But, right. And actually speaking about that, sticking on music, there's another point that you brought up. Don't use pop music. Just don't. Unless you get all of the right licenses. And as a musician myself, I've often told podcasters in our webinars and just in general in our support, as much as we aren't, let's say, the, the legal of podcasting, today's landscape, just like with guest releases, the best mode of using music is to get a release from the artist, much like the releases we discussed at the top of the show for the interviews. Uh, with popular music, this obviously becomes harder since you don't only need one license and you may need multiple. 
Yeah, the, one of the misconceptions in what we were just what you were just saying is that the artist necessarily has the the right to give you the permission to use their music. If uh, you know, most recording artists are signed to a record label, and that means that the recording company, the record company, owns the copyright in the in the recording of the song. More importantly, there's probably a songwriter who wrote the the musical composition that is embodied in that recording, and may or may not be the artist. But even then, most artists, most I should say, most recording art, uh, most musical <laughs> music songwriters—that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> most songwriters uh, are signed with publishers, and so the music publishing company actually owns the copyright in, or at least the right to administer the copyright in the composition. So right there, you've got. If you ask the artist, the artist may he may even think that they have the right to do it, but often they don't. So. You, if you if you're going to use a piece of pop music, you need to get permission from the publisher that owns the the copyright and the composition. You need to get permission from the recording company that owns the the master recording involved, and you need the permission to use it in several different ways. One way being the streaming, uh, whether it's a live stream or or a streaming on a on a website with a player. That's one kind of a license, and on the musical composition side that stream would be considered a public performance and that would be regulated or, or administered by the public uh, performance rights societies, the uh, ASCAP and BMI and CSAC and GMR here in the U.S. And in other countries, there are other societies. So you don't even get that license from the publisher. You get that from one of those entities. Then for the, for the recording, I'm sorry, you, so you have the stream and for the recording, the stream would be managed by... Um, either by the record label or an outfit called uh, Sound Exchange. And then for the download, you got to go direct to the publisher and direct to the record label for those things. So it's a four-stop shopping. Number one, I can always appreciate when somebody talks about PROs and they bring up CSAC. So thank yeah. you for that. <laughs> Secondarily to that, it's always interesting to me that this is one of the biggest opportunities for podcasters, especially in the landscape that we're in now, because there's so many resources out there for uh, royalty-free music. There's so many resources, so many artists. There's so many ways that you can get a piece of music that even comes close to the classics that you love and you know the the rights are already taken care of for you so for me it's always interesting that in the landscape of 2020 we still have this sort of issue obviously if you are looking to use a really famous piece of music then definitely you have to go down the legal roads there can be expenses but you know oftentimes you can get something that's close with the legal use that uh, you intend to have or that you need. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I understand people wanting to use the famous music that, that they hear on the, on the radio or that they have, you know, they bought the albums from that artist. You know, maybe there's someone who loves to do a music-based podcast where they're, you know, literally reviewing an artist's, uh, the anthology of an artist's work, for example, or something like that. I, I get the desire to do that. And, and a lot of people have grown up in, in an environment where you would hear those shows on the radio on Sunday night or something like that. And, and so the thinking is, well, if they can do it on radio, I can do it on podcasting. And I'm here to say podcasting is not the same as terrestrial radio. It just isn't. The rules are different and we have to understand those differences. Now to change gears a little bit here, the next point that you say is you should use an LLC if you plan to monetize seriously. And the seriously is what really caps it off as important, but <laughs> this is so true. When it comes to LLCs, uh, for podcasters who haven't already created an LLC, why is it essential if one of the goals is monetization? Well, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that w if you plan to monetize, then you need to take, your, take it seriously as a business generally. If you're just a hobbyist and you're just doing it for fun and you're willing to follow all, the other, uh, all these other rules, then... Maybe the forming a company to be the podcast doesn't really matter that much because, you know, the things that an LLC offers are, um, well, the, the main one is the limitation of liability. That is the, the, the owners of the, of the LLC, the members of the LLC are liable for damages and injuries and, and, and liabilities that come up for the company only to the extent that they've invested their money in that company. So... You know, you, you buy some equipment, you put that into the company, and that's sort of the scope of your investment, the extent of your investment. If something goes wrong and the podcast infringes somebody's copyright, trademark, defames somebody, causes somebody an injury, or somebody slips and falls in the studio 
and the podcast is the owner of the, the company is the owner of the studio, well, then they look to the, the company for their, uh, you know, compensation. And, uh, and they don't get to come after your house and your car and your pension fund and all those kinds of things. So that's the big reason why I think people need to form an LLC. But another thing, and by the way, when you're entering into contracts, like with sponsors or, or doing um, um, endorsements and affiliate relationships and things like that, doing it in the name of the company, again, separates the individual from, from the business in, in ways that are useful for the government regulatory side of things and, and the breach of contract potential as well. Uh, other reasons that you do an LLC are to uh, help uh, establish and and uh, define the management and ownership structure if you have co-hosts or partners bringing them into an llc where the you know relationship is very clearly defined with a with a, a good operating agreement and you know the equivalent of bylaws basically of how the business is going to run that's very important um uh, it, it provides a little street cred people like you know companies and businesses like to do business with other businesses rather than just you know, John in his basement over there, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if that, if you're in a basement, but uh, <laughs> um, the, you know, so, so uh, yeah, so I, th- I think the LLC, oh, and it, it provides some tax advantages. A, a business can often take tax deductions for things that an individual can't. You can, you can use it to set up pension plans. So there's a lot of valuable reasons to do it. And if, if making your podcast a business is the goal and by, by making it a business, I mean making money from it. Uh, I think that you need to start acting like a business. And the sooner you start that LLC and get yourself organized, the better, because it's just easier when it's, you know, you've got a new podcast. Uh, you only have those few episodes that you've done maybe to, to, to bring into the company and transfer ownership. The more you've got out there before you form, the more you've got that sort of long tail of liability and risk related to the old stuff. And then, you know, look, it could be years later that somebody discovers your episode where you said something that hurt their reputation or something like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I think early and often form your LLC. I think because of the podcasting industry being relatively simple and simplistic to start up, simple to host, simple to record, and you can really do whatever you could talk about, whatever you're looking to talk about on a podcast. I think we often overlook the importance of an LLC or the importance of like we were talking about a little bit before, or like we'll talk about now, podcasters agreements. You know, yeah. you bring it up, a co-host should sign a contract. It's like a prenup. Work it out before you get frustrated with each other. Um, it can be a sore topic sometimes between hosts. Again, it, it's not always the most comfortable conversation. But honestly, if you're even in a looser, like fun working relationship with somebody else, this can be a real lifesaver if the host declines or, or anything happens with the relationship between members, a member leaves for some reason. Uh, why do you think it's a sore topic, though, if you're talking about, even if you're not talking about a, monet- a monetizing podcast, why do you think this could be a sore topic? Well, I think everybody gets invested in what they're doing and they feel like they want to own, you know, their, excuse me, their share of whatever it is that they're doing. And so, you know, look, when, when the basic rule is this, and this is copyright law 101, when two people come together to create a single work for, you know, a unitary whole, uh, they are joint owners, joint authors of that work and therefore both own the copyright. So unless there's something specific that, changes their intention, uh, that manifests that they've changed their intention. So that's why having an agreement that says, hey, the show belongs to host one and host two comes on and does their thing and and is entitled to whatever they're entitled to in terms of percentages or something like that, but it will be owned by host number one. Um, I I think it's possible to, what am I trying to say, possible to uh, balance things out in such a way. The fact of it is the host number one is also going to carry the, that liability for the show or the, or the LLC would carry that liability. So um, you look, people get bent out of shape after, especially when they've been doing a show for months and months or years and years together. And then someone says, okay, it's time to formalize this relationship. You know, the show's mine, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so again, early and often get this kind of thing taken care of at the beginning so that you don't have any misunderstandings. And the fact of it is, if you want to be the owner of your show singly and you want to have a co-host or, or someone come on your show um, and you tell them, Hey, I, you know, it's my show, but I'd love to have you on as a regular co-host. Uh, 
but you know, I'll own it. But you know, if you have that conversation early on and they are objecting to that structure, then maybe they're not the right co-host to, to have and better to find the, find that out early, I guess. I would agree. And I think that the podcasters agreement does a lot to really show the seriousness of what all the hosts are looking to do with yeah. the podcast. You know, it may be something as simple as, oh, we have some free time on a Friday night and we really just want an outlet to just speak about everything and anything. But, you know, you talk about that even, everything and anything, you could also get onto some dicey topics that, yeah. you know, may hurt one person or the other yep. and then you're off to the races in that conversation. But, and then you yeah. get into the, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, but when it comes to the podcasters agreement, you know, when you start really laying out terms and they don't have to be the craziest of terms, as you said, it can really just be, okay, who's the owner? What are we doing with this? And, you know, in the case that somebody leaves, who owns it? Someone mm -hmm. may simply go, I'm doing this for fun. So if I, if I leave, you can keep doing this. You know, it really, I think, puts a lot more onus on a podcaster to realize what podcasting can do because you're still it's a still a broadcasted medium once you record a podcast if you put it on you know podbean or you put it on apple Podcasts or wherever you go to mm -hmm. it's now public it's for consumption so you're still having to take some sort of accountability for it you and whoever you're working with at some point or another yeah so the other side of this is when when you do have those people who've just gotten together on sunday nights to do their show about you know sports or whatever and one of them decides you know what i'm done with this does you have to evaluate is that going to end the show you know what if you what if the person's ticked off and doesn't want you to continue the show even though they're the one leaving you know so again having a, a clear agreement about who owns what and who has the right to do things and, and so on and maybe it even includes a buy sell provision you know if you if one of the parties is, is asked to leave or chooses to leave then we will pay them out this way or we will you know continue to provide them uh, a portion of the revenues from the first hundred episodes that they were on, or you know, those, you, you can you can uh, you can try to anticipate all those kinds of things, or not in the agreement, and uh, and just deal with it. I want to tell just one story about a client of mine. Uh, this happened last year, where uh, he he this is a guy who owns a podcasting network, and one of the shows on the network was one of these you know TV follow up shows where they would discuss the episode each week. And in between seasons at one point, well, along the way, he ended up having various co-hosts on the show. And it, it, along the way, one of them sort of emerged as the main co-host of the show. And then eventually the co-host sort of was in a position of being the main host. And my client ended up being sort of the co-host on the show. And um, at some point they, they had a little bit of a disagreement about how they were going to monetize. Were they going to do a Patreon or were they going to do direct advertising or were they going to just, you know, ask for donations or, or whatever it was. And they came, they had a little bit of a friction about it. And at some point this is via text messaging, be careful about text messaging. The, uh, the network guy, my guy texted to the, the other guy, you know, it's pretty much your show. Or actually he said, you know, it's your show. So I'm going to defer to you take care, do it. We'll do it the way you want or something along those lines. Well, that it's your show came back to bite him because they didn't have any written agreement about their relationship. And the now lead host, formerly co-host came along and said, well, you said it's my show. So I own it now and I'm taking it off the network and I'm going to do it my way. Wow. And yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll tell you that, uh, at the end of the day, we, we spent probably eight or 10 months going back and forth, working out the legal stuff, you know, hang, haggling over various things because the next season of the show was coming up and there were things to, to be dealt with. Uh, it ended up being a big dispute between the parties. And I think they, they each spent far more money than they would ever have received from doing the show on the legal fees. And money did have to change hands in order for uh, in this instance, the the co now co-host, excuse me, the the newer host uh, ended up buying the show from the network, and uh, uh, you know because hey, <laughs> there was a dispute over who owns it, and that could have been solved with a relatively simple co-host agreement at the very beginning. 
And I think you brought up, the, I think that whole over arc shows a really important point. This stuff can and should be resolved before you even hit the air very early yeah. on, because there's so much that can go on. And especially even if you start up a podcast that mm -hmm. is more like we were talking about, like on a Sunday with your friends, all of a sudden, if it is something that gets serious, you end up having more fun with it. It then grows, it develops. You know, if you set these standards and guidelines early on, you, if you, God forbid you have to go down the road of going to court, you're going to have to run into this anyway. You're going to have right. to come up with the legal terms and conditions post recording 100, 200 episodes later, seasons mm -hmm. later. So honestly, it's a matter, I think, sometimes of putting the ego aside and really just coming in and creating even just a couple pages of here's what we're talking about. It can't be more important. I think it's one of the most important things you could do as a podcaster. I agree. I agree. You know, and it, you, we, we use the reference to the prenuptial agreement earlier. Right. It really is a question of, you know, what happens if we break up? Who gets the kids? Right. <laughs> <laughs> who gets the house? Who gets the car? You know, so that's really what you're trying to accomplish here. And uh, um, work it out when you're still happy about it. So now we're going to move into the topic of trademarking and title. Uh, one thing that you wrote here was pick a title that isn't already in use or likely to be confused with one that is. Do a search not just Google, but check podcast directories, trademark registries, and save the big headaches later. So when it comes to businesses and podcasts, businesses often teeter on the line between wanting a unique name, but also something that has a broad Google search result ping, especially now in 2020. Yeah. You bring up a great point about podcasting directories and trademark registries as necessary to search for title usage. Um, those are the legal places that you should be going to. Uh, there's also a notion, though, that if you choose a title that's already used, but it's part of another industry that doesn't intersect with yours, then you can usually use that title and trademark it. Uh, can, you said, can you shed some light on if this would be true or false? Well, it is... It is sort of true. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> trademark, the trademark law, first of all, just real quickly, what a trademark is, legally speaking, is a word, symbol, phrase, or design of some sort that is, is distinctive and sets the, uh, and is used as an identifier of the source or origin of a product or service. So uh, the classic example is if you see a sort of a checkmark looking swoosh on the side of, you know, athletic clothing or something like that, we know what company it came from. Uh, and who the source is, right? That's Nike right. or three stripes is Adidas or um, uh, a red triangle on a corner of a box of cookies or crackers. That's Nabisco, right? You know, they, these are instant identifiers. That's what a trademark is. It's the brand. Just like the, uh, you know, searing a, a shape or a design onto the side of a cow to show which ranch it came from in the, in the old <laughs> days, right? So that's branding, right? So you want to, that's why I say you want to choose something that's distinctive because otherwise you don't have the kind of protection that you're looking at. Now, this question about picking something from another industry, uh, it is true that trademarks are, are registered and categorized in these various classes of goods or services. And, and podcasts fall into basically two classes. One is the entertainment media kind of thing. That's class 41 for those who are following along at home. And uh, the other one is class nine, which covers downloadable recordings um, or, you know, sales of recordings, basically. So we have two classes in which trademarks can uh you know, it would apply to a podcast, but you know, if you have t-shirts and hats and things like that, or, you know, can cozies or whatever else, there may be other classes that you apply to. So the, the what's true is that, look, if, if there's a company that already uses an, a, a brand, a name in, in their business of making, I don't know, medical equipment, or uh, let's say it's, you know, photocopy equipment, you, I guess you could theoretically adopt the name of that same brand for your podcast. Um, more importantly, if you're not actually talking about that product or service, because then you get into some weird, weird questions. But, you know, so if, but, but again, there are certain trademarks that are so powerful, so strong that you wouldn't be able to get away with it by adopting that. So uh, if you, if you create the Xerox podcast, right, <laughs> or just the show called Xerox, People are going to be confused. They're going to think that the Xerox company, the company that makes copiers and computer equipment, has something to do with this podcast. And that still is trademark infringement. Um, you couldn't call your podcast Double Mint <laughs> or, or uh, 
I don't know. I mean, you might be able to get away with something like uh, pay less, you know, when you know, pay less shoes being the example I'm thinking of that, because that's a very descriptive brand, right? It does. Although it is a brand for shoe, shoe stores, I think they've gone out of business now, but uh, it's also, you know, descriptive of lots of, suggestive of lots of other things like maybe just how to find bargains and discounts. So if you do a show about bargains and discounts and calling it pay less or how to pay less, you're probably not going to have a problem, but the Xerox show, uh, the Ford show, you know, those kinds of things, you're going to get into trouble. So, um, I, my, my feeling is you want to choose something that's very distinctive and that hasn't been used by anybody else for anything that might remotely suggest a connection between the two. And the, the more powerful, the more well-known, the more famous a brand is, um, that we almost call them super brands, you know, that something like a Xerox or Ford or something, just stay as far from those as you can. Sure. And also you brought up the point of let's use Payless as the example. Mm -hmm. If you are calling your show Payless, that may be difficult, but if you're putting identifiers before and after and you're saying how to pay less or pay less and you're kind of going over tips and strategies, let's say for uh, financial management and wealth management, things of that nature, potentially, it sounds like you probably could, but obviously case to case to case, obviously, you yeah. know, this is an informational podcast. We're not really saying, Hey, what is the end all be all of everything? <laughs> right. Right. So again, it's that question of distinctiveness and, and does your choice of the wording distinguish you from the other? So again, you know, um, if I, if I create my show and call it all things a Xerox, <laughs> it's still, you know, people are still going to think there's something to connect to, to Xerox if I wanted to. And my example of how to pay less might not be a great one because the, the pay less people did own, do or did own a trademark. And um, it's still possible that there could be some confusion. To, you, you know, this is an area where you'd look at the totality of things and the the look and feel of the design of the cover art and those, you know, make sure you're not using the same color scheme and font styles and things like that. Um, where it becomes an interesting one is when you have these TV show oriented, uh, uh, show podcasts. Um, one, uh, one fellow who's fairly prominent in the industry had a show about a particular TV program and, uh, his look and feel of his artwork. And he mentioned the name of the show in the title of his podcast, which you sort of had to do in order to describe what the show is about, right? He ended up having some trouble with the producers of the show because they found that his uh, cover art looked too much like the TV show's uh, graphic design for the posters and things like that. And so they ended up working it out and, and uh, uh, getting him to make a few relatively minor changes that allowed him to proceed. And then they had an agreement between them going forward as to where the, where the boundaries were. Um, so, it, you know, sometimes it's possible to sort of coexist with another brand, but again, you know, be thoughtful about it and consult someone like me before you go into that. If you're, if you're getting into that situation, you, you know, it is always better to call your lawyer before you get into the issue rather than when you get that nasty letter from their lawyer, because it's just going to be more back and forth and more expensive to, to work with folks. So. Of course. So when it comes to the podcasting world, especially as we talked about earlier, a lot of podcasting outlets can be considered journalism or can be considered review shows. You know, there's a big outlet out there for wrestling podcasts, for Game of Thrones podcasts, for sports podcasts, where you're bringing up national names and you're bringing up trademarked uh trademarked you or trademarked um brands let's say and even sometimes in the logo sometimes that can extend out to yeah. something that looks really really close and very much on the teeter of something that's really already trademarked and i want people to also understand the value of trademarking their logos too not just registering their show title as a trademark you yeah. know podcasts are about a wide range of topics but there's so many subgroups that happen you know, and especially me, I run a wrestling podcast. Our logo is a ring with uh, three ropes and things. But the way that we have it, we worked it out with the artist to where it's our own logo. We trademarked it. But show titles and logos can be extremely similar in the market of these subcultures. And I think it's really important for, you know, podcasters to understand that not only should you register the show title, but when you come up with these different images, it's a due diligence to your podcast to be able to register those images as well. Not yeah, I definitely agree with that. Absolutely, it's important to protect your branding 
um, again, early so that you don't end up with people coming in and using uh, similar, confusingly similar branding for their shows. I uh, just want to give a little anecdotal you know, story here. I, I have a client who has a show. And by the way, it, this is similar to the pay less where it's very suggestive or descriptive of what the, the brand is. In this case, the show um, uses a title that is, um, I won't say generic, but it's, it was, it, when it started was quite descriptive, but because this particular host has been using this title for five or six years, uh, she was able to register the, the title and have a trademark now for this, this particular title. And I would say once every month or two, we find somebody popping up with the same title or very similar title to the show. You know, if, if the, if it, I'm going to use pay less again as a, just a so silly example, but if it's pay less is the title of the one show and you come along and decide, I'm going to do uh, how to pay less with so-and-so that, that's a, it's a close call. Uh, you're still going to get a letter from me saying, hey, stop it, you're infringing our trademark. And if you want to fight about it, we're, we're happy to do that, but you know, take it down now. Um, but if it's just pay less with so-and-so and the new host's name or something like that, that is not enough to dispel the confusion. And so you know, once it's out there, once there's a title in use in, in the marketplace, other shows with the same title, you take your chances of whether you're going to have to force, be forced to change it later on. And, um, you know, if it's a very descriptive, look, my own show, this is me (laughs) do as I say, not as I do choose a distinctive title. My show is called entertainment law update. It pretty much tells you exactly what the show is, right? It's very descriptive. Now I've been doing the show for 11 years. And so I, I do have a trademark for my show. Nobody else better come along and call their show entertainment law update (laughs) (laughs) period. (laughs) But um, you know, had I chosen something very distinctive at the beginning, I could have protected it up front in those first years when, you know, somebody else would have come along. I could have sent them a letter saying, Hey, stop it. And, um, I would have had the law on my side if we'd had to come to a fight. So, uh, protecting your, yeah, your, your branding is, is very important. The title is, uh, in this space, logos are, are a little less likely to be copied in a confusing way. Although again, if you're using elements that are, you know, very, suggestive of your show's theme, like the ring that you described, it probably does make sense so that you don't have someone else coming up with a, pod, a, a wrestling podcast that also uses a, that kind of a cover art that, that would, again, be confused with yours. Of course. And sometimes it's really a race to the trademark too. Like if you do get into a dispute with somebody, a lot of times, and this is what you tend to see, I think around people who haven't necessarily trademarked yet, Mm -hmm. you'll get a response from the podcast or you'll get a response from the artist saying, Hey, this looks similar to mine. And then sometimes like I've seen this in a lot of different uh, promotions, different artists, Mm -hmm. different businesses, where then both parties look at themselves and they go, am I trademarked? No. And then it's just a matter of who can register the trademark first. And that can get kind of dicey sometimes. Yeah. The truth is that uh, although there is sometimes that race that you described, the, the rightful owner of the brand is the one who used it in interstate commerce first. Sure. So, um, you know, if you had your show and, and, and in fact, in the case of my client with the, uh, with the title that I described a few minutes ago, um, there was another show with a very similar title that preexisted hers. And so we've left them alone. You know, we haven't actually reached out and said, Hey, by the way, <laughs> you know, uh, cause we don't want them saying, no, you've got to stop. Here we are years and years later. And, um, you know, that's another aspect of trademark. I should just tell you is, um, if you do own a trademark, whether it's a registered trademark or not, you have an, a, an obligation to police it is what we call it, to take care of it and protect it by, making sure nobody else is using it in a confusingly similar way. Otherwise, what happens is it it essentially is deemed to become generic or descriptive and not protectable, and you lose your rights. Uh, There's a doctrine in the law that says if you sit on your rights, you may lose them. And uh, so you got to, once you have a trademark, you do have to be prepared to protect it. The last question I want to end our interview with is, on another point that you made here, and it kind of combines the last two points you made here. Don't take legal advice from non-lawyers, especially in Facebook groups. Uh, When in doubt, ask an actual lawyer privately. It needn't cost a lot, but it can save you a ton. You know, I've seen many artists, podcasters, you name it, who have taken the advice of friends and acquaintances, and it has come back to bite them. Uh, I think a lot of the times it comes down to someone maybe wanting to save a little bit of money, thinking they can kind of 
skirt around the legalities of it. But if you're looking to take your podcast seriously, official knowledge and guidance from a lawyer who's familiar with all the laws, you know, the terminologies and cases, it can only help you. More often than not, are there common topics that you usually see non-lawyers giving that are incorrect? <laughs> I'm, well, sure yes. you, I'm sure you could pull out the scroll on it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the music ones are, are the big ones because everybody wants to use music in their podcast. It's, it, you know, it's nice to, to have that produced sound and things. Um, and, and I see, I would say a couple times a week, somebody goes into one of the Facebook groups and says, how do I use music? What do I have to do you know, to do this? And a lot of people put, you know, post the correct answer. You can't do it. And there's always that one guy who, or woman who says, just use it. If they catch you, you'll take it down, you know, that kind of thing. Or, well, if you only use eight seconds of it, it's fine. You know, these, these misconceptions about, about things like that. Um, and some of them will argue aggressively for their point of view and position. Now I, as a lawyer, I go in and, you know, I probably shouldn't really be rendering legal advice in the, in the Facebook forums and groups, but I'll go in and just say, you know, that's not right. That's not how copyright works. You should talk to, you know, whatever. And uh, just, you know, my point about don't take your advice from non-lawyers is a lot of people have the right information, but only partial information. A lot of people have these misconceptions, you know, broad ideas about it. Well, I mean, if, if they do it on the radio, you must be able to do it here. And I've already said that's not the right approach. Um, but you don't know who you're getting it from. You know, uh, even a very, I've, I've had situations with even very experienced podcasters giving an answer and I see it and I go, oh, you know, not, not really correct. And I don't want to call people out and tell them they're wrong, but uh, uh, sometimes they just are. And, and, you know, it's about making sure people are safe and doing things in, in the right way. Uh, I got into just so an example of this. I got into sure. a, a situation with someone on Facebook not long ago who was taking one of these positions. Oh, I think we're talking about um, whether or not to take it down. You know, in, 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 it was the release question. Do you need sure. a release? And I, I, this is my crusade. Everybody should use a release. This guy was saying, don't bother. It's just an, an added friction point for the, for the guest. And, uh, you know, I'm never going to be able to defend against the lawsuit anyway. If somebody does threaten me, I'm just going to take it down and, and so on. And, and uh, he was uh, he was arguing very vigorously and telling me that I was giving bad legal advice. So, you know, <laughs> so I got my back up about it, right? Anyway, we got into this back and forth, big back and forth. Actually, that might have been what sort of stimulated this and this number eight item on our list. And uh, I finally went and checked him out, and I realized, okay, so this is a twenty two year old graduate student in philosophy <laughs> who has never had a day in his life where he wasn't outside the sheltered environment of school sure, and where he wasn't, you know, I, I presume a relatively poor college student or whatever. And so his point of view was motivated by his, his own life experience that he wouldn't have the money to fight, wouldn't have the resources to fight and wouldn't really have the inclination to fight, but that's not everybody. And, you know, if somebody took his point of view as gospel, uh, I feel that they would be really poorly served by that. So if you have these kinds of questions, any kind of question regarding the business of podcasting, the law around podcasting, reach out and ask somebody. I'm, I'm, I, I answer a lot of questions, um, you know, for free or cheap. And when you do need someone to actually think hard about a situation and, and do a little research and give you a formal opinion, it doesn't have to cost a fortune and it could save you three fortunes. <laughs> so uh, please, you know, Get your legal, you know, you, you wouldn't ask a, um, you wouldn't seek out advice on how to do heart surgery in the forums and legal advice and, and medicine aren't that different. <laughs> Go to the professionals. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, a lot of people, and I've heard this also within the different industries, just because somebody gives you the advice doesn't mean that they are in the right. It just means they haven't been caught yet. And when it comes to a lot of these smaller uh, podcast asking the advice again it's like we talked about earlier you could have somebody who's doing a podcast just on a Wednesday and they really just like the art of podcasting mm -hmm. but there's that one thing that all of a sudden uh, someone who's part of a bigger corporation or a bigger podcast could all of a sudden land across yours mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're in a legal battle and all you're doing is something for fun and a lot of the times you have these entities that'll say okay just take it down 
lot of the times you have these entities that will say, okay, now you owe us this. Mm -hmm. And in either case, it's still something where getting the wrong advice and even getting advice that's not catered to your specific uh, podcast or your specific art can find you in a world of trouble. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. You know, I just want to say, you know, I have a, an ebook on the subject of the law of podcasting and I, I, I have my own Facebook page, you know, for the podcast lawyer, go look for the podcast lawyer page on Facebook and, and follow me there. And I, I am offering up, uh, advice and suggestions and answering questions and those kinds of things. And, you know, I really am here to help. I'd love to, uh, have, uh, more podcasters, listening and doing things the right way, doing things safely so they don't uh, wind up on the wrong side of that company that says, now pay up. Absolutely. The whole overarching, I think, of the conversation is cover yourself in every way that you can if you're putting out a podcast for the public to listen to because you never know who's listening and you only want to make sure that you're, that everything you're doing is on the up and up as the best way it can be. Yeah, this is media production. Media production is a business and we need to start treating it like one. Absolutely. Gordon, I want to thank you again for taking the time to speak with us today. Again, these are a lot of great legal tips that podcaster of any size, any brand can really take advantage of. Um, I know that we spoke about a few different places that we could find you, but I want to give you a couple minutes to uh, plug any places that we could find you, any other resources you may not have mentioned. Uh, the floor is yours. All right. Well, the best way to find me is, is I have a website at gordonfiremark.com. That's G-O-R-D-O-N-F-I-R-E-M-A-R-K.com, uh, whereas it's sort of a clearinghouse for all of my products and services and things like that. And you can find a link to the, the podcast release that I mentioned, but you can go to podcastrelease.com for that if you like. The ebook is uh, at podcastlawbook.com. And uh, I also have podcastlawforms.com. If you're looking for contract forms for something like that co-host agreement we talked about or, or uh, confidentiality agreements and things when you're hiring your, your VA or stuff like that, all those kinds of forms are available for nominal prices for purchase on, on that site. And, um, and finally, it's that Facebook group. You know, find me on, uh, on Facebook at The Podcast Lawyer or just look for Gordon Firemark and follow my personal profile. And, um, you know, I'm here to help. I just love, I love podcasting. I love working and talking with podcasters. And uh, I look forward to hearing from folks and helping them out. Definitely. Please, anybody, use Gordon as a resource here. Again, when you're talking about podcasting, just covering yourself the, the importance of it can't be overstated or overstressed. And it may, again, it's something that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but this can save you so much. And you want to make sure that you are in the right with everything you're doing. We don't want to see podcasts getting pulled down. We don't want to see podcasters getting into any sorts of legal trouble. So again, just having a resource like Gordon is monumental. So again, thank you so much. And can't wait to speak to you soon. Thanks, John. I've been really fun being on the show. And thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us for Podcasting Smarter. You can check our show notes at podcast.podbean.com for links and details. Please like our podcast, leave your comments, and help us spread the word to other podcasters so we can bring you more great episodes with podcasting tips and inspiration from fellow podcasters. If you want to connect with other podcasters or get interviewed on this podcast, please join our Podcasting Smarter Facebook group. We look forward to welcoming you to the community. Happy podcasting.